Hello and welcome back to another episode of Better Business Bureau's Smart Consumer. If you're tuning in for the first time, our goal is to offer you tips about the marketplace, warnings about scams, and tips to prevent them, and much more. We typically interview a guest every episode, but we're going to try to do something different. There's an almost endless stream of consumer, business, and marketplace topics that come across my desk every day. And perhaps the best way to touch on as many of them as possible is in a familiar format, a newscast. So here we go. Let's begin with the latest, a data breach, and unfortunately a record setter involving the credit monitoring and reporting company Equifax. The scope of this data breach is startling. Detailed personal information from about as many as 143 million Americans was exposed in this monumental data breach. Cyber criminals managed to hack into the company's computers and walk away with extremely valuable information. The hackers were able to capture the most sensitive personal and financial information of about half the U.S. population. They were able to obtain all the details necessary for Equifax to rate consumers' financial history and their lending risk, just like its competitors, Experian and TransUnion. This information includes the basic building blocks of identity theft, such as consumers' names, addresses, and social security numbers. However, the credit monitoring companies also store crucial information about consumers' loan details, credit cards, child support payments, employment history, and much more. Ironically, consumers will often pull their credit reports from Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion to determine whether they are the victims of identity theft by looking for unauthorized lines of, click of credit. Equifax says the breach occurred between mid-May and July and was discovered July 29th. It was not made public until early September. Equifax is the second credit monitoring company to suffer a data breach. The second largest of these companies, Experian, was hacked in 2015, giving cyber thieves access to personal data on 15 million Americans. Companies that are victims of cyber attacks, like this one, typically provide free credit monitoring services for victims. What to do next? Oh, stay calm. Consumers are not liable for fraudulent charges on stolen account numbers. Obtain a credit freeze that will prevent anyone from accessing your credit report or scores, and that means you cannot apply for new credit without lifting the freeze, but it still gives you reasonable protection against identity theft. Pull credit reports from the three credit monitoring and reporting companies free of charge at the only government-sanctioned website, annualcreditreport.com. That's annualcreditreport, all one word, dot com. You're entitled to obtain one of your credit reports every 12 months. Not calendar year, but every 12 months, so stagger your requests. Ask for your report every four months from one of the three credit monitoring companies to keep a year-long watch for unusual activity, such as unauthorized lines of credit. Monitor your credit card statements carefully. If you see a fraudulent charge, report it to your bank or credit card issuer so the charge can be reversed at a new card issue. Very important, in the wake of a data breach, beware of scammers who may purport to be from the retailer, your bank, or your credit card issuer. They may tell you that your card was compromised and suggest actions to supposedly fix the problem. Phone calls or phishing emails may attempt to fool you into providing your financial or personal information or ask you to click on a link or open an attachment, which can download malware onto your computer. Check the Equifax website for the latest consumer information. You'll also find additional information and comprehensive tips from the Federal Trade Commission at FTC.org. Let's turn now to some good news, some very good news that is expected to significantly lower the risk of identity theft of Medicare beneficiaries. It involves the removal of social security numbers from Medicare cards, and that's a major step towards protecting personally identifiable information for the estimated 58 million Medicare recipients. Too many people carry their Medicare cards and those who do are at a higher risk of identity theft than the rest of the population. If your wallet or purse is lost or stolen and you're carrying your existing cards, 
Crooks will have enough information to steal your identity. The social security numbers will be replaced by an 11 character ID number consisting of uppercase letters and numbers. In March, Medicare recipients coming on board will receive the new cards, while existing Medicare beneficiaries will have their cards replaced as well. Healthcare providers are also working on their systems to implement the changes. The program is set to begin in April 2018 as new beneficiaries come on board and existing Medicare cards will be replaced with their new ones. The deadline for completion of the changeover is April 2019. When the Affordable Air, uh, Care Act, Obamacare, came into effect, con artists started working the phones, threatening people they'd lose their benefits unless they handed over personal or financial information. So some people may get calls from imposters claiming to be with Medicare and demanding personal information, again threatening their benefits. Well, it doesn't work like that. Government departments will never call you for information or threaten you. Despite what they say, the changeover will not affect your benefits. In the meantime, while you do need the card for a first appointment with a new doctor, there's no need to keep it with you the rest of the time. You can take a photo of your card and keep it on your password-protected smartphone, or give it to a trusted friend or relative in case of an emergency when you're unable to speak for yourself. By the way, even if you don't have your Medicare card with you, a hospital will still treat you and you can provide your Medicare information later. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services will keep us informed in, as March approaches. We go now to the flood-ravaged areas of the country. When disaster strikes, the criminals and con artists follow the headlines and move in quickly, and in this case, Hurricane flood damaged cars are expected to inundate the used car market. So, Better Business Bureau is alerting consumers looking for a used car that it might look pristine but may have hidden extensive flood damage. Among the hundreds of thousands of cars from flood battered areas, there are vehicles that insurance companies say would cost more to repair than they're worth and would likely be sold at auction for parts or scrap. An estimated 500,000 to 1 million vehicles were flooded in the Houston area alone during Harvey. A special agent with the National Insurance Crime Bureau says used vehicles from Texas and Florida would typically be sold online through classified ad sites, fake used car websites, and unscrupulous dealers who are not going to disclose to buyers vehicles underlying damage. History shows us that there's a pattern that used car buyers would do well to know about these scams as we see photos and video of cars sitting in several feet of water. It would be a serious mistake not to take the necessary precautions. According to Carfax, over 271,000 affected cars remained on the nation's roads last year, and that number is expected to swell considerably in the wakes of Hurricanes Harvey and Irma. The damaged cars are freshly painted, cleaned or repaired on the inside for sale, but they hide a variety of problems, some of which are dangerous. The first indications of hidden flood damage can be found if you lift up a corner of the carpet and discover water damage. The list of potential problems include heavy rust damage on the vehicle's frame, a new paint job, new carpets, because they can hide damage to mechanical systems, the underside of the vehicle, the brakes, the suspension system, transmission, electrical systems, and mold. Flood damage may require an expensive and extensive disassembly for cleaning and reconditioning, and the end result is that a vehicle that needs work that will cost considerably more than the seller's price. The National Insurance Crime Bureau warns buyers to be especially careful in the coming weeks and months as thousands of hurricane-damaged vehicles may reappear on sale across the nation, a problem that also occurred in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in 2005. There are paid services that can give you a detailed history of a vehicle. Better Business Bureau's advice is don't buy without seeing the vehicle. If you're buying from out of state, plan a trip to check the vehicle instead of relying on photos. Look for signs of cosmetic work. These include a fresh paint job, 
recently shampooed or replaced carpeting, or freshly cleaned upholstery that may have been performed subsequent to flooding. Check under the carpeting. Pull up a corner of the carpeting, both in the passenger compartment and the trunk, and check for water residue, stain marks, signs of rust, and or evidence of mold or a musty odor. Search for other signs of damage, such as checking under the dashboard for brittle wiring and evidence of dried mud and other deposits. Look for rust on screws in the center console and other areas that may have been submerged. Get it thoroughly checked by a mechanic. Before putting down a deposit, get a qualified mechanic to examine the vehicle from top to bottom. You can never know what they'll find. It's not a free service, but it is money well spent. If you'd like to donate to relief efforts for flood victims, we have some tips for you. Whenever there is desperation, scammers see opportunities to make money from generous donors. Now, there are three types of charities, the ones that do it properly, the well-meaning ones that do not have the experience in collecting and distributing money, and the third involves outright fraud. Unfortunately, charity fraud is a multi-victim crime. It hits donors, their money goes into scammers' pockets, and the victims who are desperate but never receive the stolen donations. So we have a few tips for you. Better Business Bureau recommends against giving to unsolicited charity appeals over the phone, at the front door, or on the internet, particularly through social media. The truth is that if someone calls you pretending to be collecting for a legitimate charity, you can never be sure who's on the other end of the line. Caller identification can easily be spoofed to make it look like a legitimate call. Someone at the front door may have some sort of in, uh, identification indicating that they're associated with the charity, but you can't really trust that method of making a donation. As for the internet, hundreds of fake fundraising websites with look-alike names to real charities pop up quickly to scam donors. Now, the problem with social media is that if someone sends you a link, even a friend, it may take you to a look-alike charity page for your credit card information, or it could download malicious software into your computer. Best thing to do is to be proactive, not reactive. In other words, you choose the charity you want to give to, contact them directly, uh, rather through a link, through social media or email. If they are not involved in fundraising, ask who has their boots on the ground. And once you choose a charity, check them out at give.org, which is BBB's charity arm to see if they meet the 20 standards of charity accountability. That's give.org. Next, more good news about computers and passwords. Now, if you dislike creating and remembering passwords, and most people do, then you'll like this next story. Consumers find creating a strong password tedious and complicated, and the passwords are difficult to remember. And that's likely why many consumers reuse the same password for multiple sites. Now, the existing recommendations are old and based upon outdated advice. Existing recommendations for strong passwords were ill-conceived and not really necessary, and that's according to the man who literally wrote the book on password safety standards commonly used today by businesses, government agencies, and consumers. That man is Bill Burr, who wrote a white paper in 2003 for the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and the recommendations were based upon the best information about hacking that was available at that time. Now, the existing standards for strong passwords recommend the use of a combination of upper and lowercase letters, numerals, and symbols. But Burr, who's now retired, told the Wall Street Journal something unexpected by technology experts. He says he got it wrong and told the publication, quote, much of what I said, I now regret. I'm sorry. One publication did the math, and they came to an interesting conclusion. Keep it simple. So if you take a password like capital T, zero, U, D, R, dollar sign, and three, that's actually considered to be a weak password that could be broken in as few as three days. On the other hand, it turns out that a string of unrelated words is safer. No numerals or symbols are required. So experts say something like correct horse battery staple could take 
550 years to hack. It's comprised of random, easily remembered words, and that's what's considered to be best practice right now. Another area where Burr said he was wrong was his recommendation to change passwords on a monthly basis well, several times a year if necessary. He now says there's no reason to change passwords unless they're compromised in a data breach. To make the entire process less complicated, there are paid and free versions of what's called password management programs. When you visit a site, the software asks if you'd like to save the login and password and it can fill in those fields the next time you visit the site. These programs can also generate passwords for you, eliminating the need to do so yourself. Best advice, don't use the same password for more than one site. If there's a data breach, cyber criminals will try your logins all over the internet. An easier solution to the login password combination is not far away. The next step will likely involve biometrics, such as using authentication by fingerprint eye scanning, or facial recognition. Another issue that is one of consumers' biggest complaints is illegal marketing calls and robocalls. Well, now you can help reduce the number of scam telephone calls as part of a new Federal Trade Commission program. The FTC initiative involves providing telecommunications companies and other industry partners with known robocallers' telephone numbers every day to bolster efforts to reduce and prevent the computer-dialed calls. Now, the FTC collects scammers' telephone numbers from consumer complaints to the Do Not Call Registry, either online or by telephone. The more consumers report the numbers, the faster it can develop its blacklist database. More consumers file complaints with the FTC about robocalls than any other single issue. In the first five months of 2017, the FTC says it received 1.9 million complaints, and that's only from consumers who took the time to report them. Well, there are a few issues that anger consumers as much as these unwanted calls, and robocalls are more irritating. They're also at the heart of a huge percentage of attempts to deceive consumers into disclosing personal and financial information. At the moment, blacklisting robocall telephone numbers, what we're talking about, is the most effective method of blocking them as researchers continue their work on technology to stop them. Connecticut BBB offers you some tips to help reduce the frequency of unwanted calls. Get onto the Do Not Call Registry. You can help populate the FTC robocall database by calling or registering online at donotcall.gov. You'll stop receiving legitimate marketing calls and make it easier to report the fraudulent ones. Don't press any digits on your keypad. Ignore recorded prompts to press digits on your telephone keypad to be taken off their calling list, for example. Well, if you press any keys, it tells the scammers you have an active number, that you're amenable to picking up calls from unknown numbers, and willing to follow a call to action. Your number will then be sold to other telemarketers. It's called the suckers list, and the frequency of calls will increase. Beware of corporate ID fraud. Callers may use the name of a legitimate company to lend credibility to their pitches. So hang up, and if it differs from the number of the legitimate company, report the number to the Do Not Call Registry. Watch out for bait and switch callers. Some will ask something such as, is Jane there? And when you tell them they have the wrong number, they'll change the subject and may ask a question such as, well, while you're on the phone, have you thought about installing new carpets in your home? Well, don't pick up the phone is another way of dealing with this. If you don't know the incoming number, let it ring. And if the call goes to voicemail, you may be able to discern what sort of a call it is. Law enforcement, technical experts, regulators, and industry have been working diligently to stop the illegal marketing calls and have had success in tracking down and shutting down robocall and live marketing call operations. In the meantime, you can help stop the illegal marketing calls by simply reporting all of them to the Do Not Call Registry. As the country struggles with an epidemic of opiate abuse, Better Business Bureau is warning consumers that con artists are peddling useless home-based detoxification products. 
They say the products can help ease the discomfort of drug withdrawal. Unfortunately, their claims have absolutely no data to back up those promises. The Federal Trade Commission has won court orders barring several companies from selling products with names such as Withdrawal Ease and Recovery Ease. The regulators say these products manufacturers made false claims about their products that were unsupported by scientific evidence. According to the charges, several companies were cashing in on addiction to heroin and painkillers. In one court order, a complaint written against Caitlin Enterprises said the company claimed that its products alleviated the symptoms of opiate withdrawal and significantly increased the likelihood of sufferers overcoming addiction. Well, millions of Americans suffering from addiction are looking for help to end their physical dependence. There is no quick fix, and con artists are peddling useless products, claiming they can make the detoxification process easier. People who are addicted need help, not empty promises. The fake products are not cheap. With one product, an 8-ounce bottle was sold for $75 and was promoted as a proprietary blend of various herbs and other natural products. As is the case with useless weight loss products, a user in one testimonial claimed the product worked within a half hour, relieving symptoms and giving him what he said was a new sense of clarity. Well, there are legitimate medical and therapy-based treatments and we urge people fighting opiate addiction to consult a healthcare professional instead of losing money on products that have no scientific proof that they're effective. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of Better Business Bureau's Smart Consumer. If we can help protect at least one person who is watching from marketplace scams, or if we told you something that you didn't know, then it was well worth it. The best way to protect ourselves is through education. So we ask that you share what you've learned today with your family members, friends, colleagues, and neighbors. BBB Serving Connecticut would like to express its gratitude to Nutmeg TV for providing the people, studios, and time to produce this show. Finally, thank you for letting us into your home. We'll see you next time on Better Business Bureau's Smart Consumer. I'm Howard Schwartz. Take care.